extend a special welcome to the entire Stewart clan. It's a joy to have you with us here today for the baptism. Welcome. Uh, there's a number of announcements that I'd encourage you to check out here on the back of the bulletin. A lot of things happening, especially in the summer season. A lot of things happening for our youth and our high school acolyte training today. Uh, but today we have a number of special guests. And so, Pam, I wanted to invite you to come on board, if you would, please. All right. Pam, we want to introduce who you are and why you're here and how we know you. Hi, my name is Pam DeMond. This is my second time here, I believe, at St. John's. And I just want to thank you guys for your hospitality to us every time that I have come. I'm a missionary in Honduras. We're in the Central Highlands in the mountains. Um, we have 18 girls now in our home. Um, your congregation had a team that came this year, and we got a well dug. The well came about, I had a child, all my kids were going to a, a private school. And uh, it just worked out that in a rural area there was a church that came in and put this private school. And I had one that just had some social problems and she couldn't continue there, so I put her in the public school. And they said, well, you have to have a term to come and cook for all the school. And I said, no problem. So I, drove over there, unloaded all my stuff, and I noticed that there were like bottles of Coke bottles, random Coke bottles, all different sizes, full of just brown, murky water. And I thought, oh, you guys are gonna plant a garden, that's nice. And they said, no. I told the, the teacher told me, she said, I told the children to bring their drinking water for today because we didn't have any. And I had no idea. And I live probably about from here to the parking lot from this school and I had no idea. I was about doing the mission with the girls and I was focused on that and doing all the things and cooking and getting them to school and all the things that you, everybody does. Um, but the school, the public school was right below me and I had no idea that this was going on. So anyways, you guys sent a team down there. Um, they partnered with another church out of Round Rock and um, they gave some matching funds and then they just sent two ladies to just check out y'all's work, which was wonderful. Um, we have um, water, and I think they said it has the capacity for 80 gallons a minute. I had all the pump and the motor ready to go when I left in May to bring it back. They were supposed to have created the motor, they did not. And so it was in a cardboard box and it wouldn't fly, so I had to put it on boat. And so we're just waiting for that. It was supposed to come this week, and it didn't, no surprise. And so, anyways, it's supposed to be next week, When, but it's worked out well. Everybody's getting um, their pipes into their houses and everything, so this is for a whole community. Um, we're so excited that this has happened, y'all. I mean, I had no idea. Sometimes we get so busy, focused on what we're doing, that right down the road, you know, somebody else has got a whole lot more problems than, than I thought that I did. So anyways, I just want to thank you guys for taking the time to step aside and help us look and be able to meet somebody else's need. I appreciate y'all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Pam. And if you remember, a few weeks ago, we had a video from, from Honduras from our mission trip down there. Uh, and Pam is the missionary who lives down there and who coordinates that effort at the project Talibah Kumi. So. Uh, it's a joy to have you with us here, Pam. Thank you. Uh, and I also wanted to invite up, there were two new members, uh, Dennis and Susan Reed Hazel. There you go. Uh, now, Dennis and Susan, they went through all of the new member courses, but the actual new member Sunday, they were out of town. They weren't able to be here. And so that you wanted the opportunity to come up and introduce yourselves. I'm Susan Reed Hazel. Good morning. I'm Dennis Reed Hazel. Uh, we spent most of our adult life in uh, Victoria, but we came up here to be family and really just uh, grandma and grandpa Uber for these guys. I'm Carly. She's our granddaughter we came for. Well, welcome. It's a joy to have you with us here. And uh, you know, you, you weren't here for the, the round of applause, the welcome round of applause, so we'll give you one all to yourself. Let's give them a welcome. <laughs> So welcome, Pam. It's a joy.
joy to have you. Welcome, Dennis and Susan. Welcome to the Stewart family. Uh, we've come to worship the Lord Jesus, so therefore let us pray. Lord God Almighty, we thank you and we praise you for this day. God, you have called us to this place, that you might come into our lives and serve us. And so, Lord Jesus, we pray. Lord, help us to let go of the things that distract us, that we might focus on you and be blessed by you, for that is why you have come here today. We pray this, Jesus, in your holy name. Amen. Amen. So our service this morning begins with a brief order of confession and forgiveness, which is found on the screen above us. It's also on page two in the maroon, the maroon hymnal in front of you. If you would, please stand as you are willing and be. We begin in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. Let us confess our sin to God, who is faithful and just, and who has promised to forgive our sin and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Most merciful God, have mercy on us. We confess to you that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not trusted you with our whole heart. We have not loved one another in deed and in truth. In your compassion, forgive our sin and so uphold us by our spirit. to you that Almighty God, rich in mercy, abundant in love, forgives you all your sin and grants you newness of life in Jesus Christ. Thanks be to God. And the peace of the Lord be with you always. Let us share peace.
and lead us to choose the one thing which will not be taken from us. Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Please be seated for the lesson. Mary has chosen the better portion, which will not be taken from her. This 
This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise you, Lord Christ. Amen. Please be seated. I preach this morning in the name of God, the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And so we continue today with our summer journey through the gospel of Luke. We're on the road with Jesus as Jesus is walking toward Jerusalem. And so far on the road, we've met some interesting characters who've taught us a thing or two. So we met the Gerasi Damani, who taught us about welcoming Jesus into our lives. We met those three men on the road, those three would-be disciples who taught us about denying ourselves, taking up our cross, and following Jesus. Last week, we heard the parable of the Good Samaritan, which taught us about love of neighbor. And this week, we meet Mary and Martha, who teach us about the love of God. Now, their story is found on page 845 in the Pew Bible. Page 845 in the Pew Bible. It's Luke chapter 10. If you've brought your own Bible, I invite you to open up and follow along. It's a short story, a familiar story, and yet it's one with a very surprising point. Because it seems to me that the lesson of this story is simply this, that when it comes to God, sometimes less is more. Let's take a look. Page 845, Luke chapter 10, and we'll pick it up there with verse 38. Now, as they went on their way, Jesus entered a certain village where a woman named Martha welcomed him into her home. She had a sister named Mary. So Mary and Martha are sisters, and presumably Martha is the older of the two. And I say that because if you notice, the house is called her home. Right? Martha welcomed him into her home, so presumably she's the older of the two, and she certainly does act that way, doesn't she? I mean, she certainly does act like a firstborn child, you know, she takes responsibility, she takes charge, she's very busy, and, you know, frankly, she's a little bit bossy. And for her part, you know, Mary is playing the role of the younger child, of the baby in the family, because if you notice, Apparently, Mary quickly lost interest and drifted away from the task at hand, leaving it incomplete for someone else to pick up the pieces. And the reason I say that is because of what Martha says there in verse 40. Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to do all the work by myself? So apparently, Mary was working with Martha, but then Mary left Martha, leaving Martha holding the bag, which Martha did not appreciate one bit. Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to do all this work by myself? Tell her then to help me. But the Lord answered her, Martha, Martha, you were worried and distracted by many things, but there's need of only one thing. Mary has chosen the better part which will not be taken away from her. So clearly the moral of this very short story is that we are to be more like Mary and less like Martha. Of course, that's where I'll end up with my sermon. But I want to take our time getting there on the way. Because I don't know about you, but I've always thought that Martha kind of gets the short end of the stick with the children. I mean, after all, we all want to be like Mary. But I think in practice, we tend to live a lot more like Martha. And so we end up often feeling like her, feeling overburdened, overworked, overlooked, and unloved. So let's take a look. I mean, Martha is not a bad person. Right? Martha is not a bad person. Just put yourself in her shoes for a moment. This is verse 38. Now, as they went on their way, Jesus entered a certain village where a woman named Martha welcomed him into her home. And stop for a moment and reflect that Jesus never traveled alone. Right? Jesus always had the 12 apostles with him. So this is a party of 13 that showed up unexpectedly out of the blue one day on her doorstep hungry and looking for something to eat. You ever try to get a table for 13 in a restaurant? That's a lot of people. Plus, they've been walking on the road all day, so these are some very hungry men. Plus, they are religious men, religious leaders, which puts extra pressure on Martha to do everything right and be in her best behavior when she's doing it. I mean, imagine if I were to show up at your doorstep today with my wife and our six kids, and I'd say, hi, I'm here for dinner. <laughs> what would you do? Now, of course, you know, you do the right thing on the one hand, like you'd let us come in because I am the pastor, like who's going to turn on the pastor, right? <laughs> but on the other hand, there are eight of us in the Waters family. Half of us are teenagers. That's a lot of food, you know? <laughs> this is no small thing we're asking, but of course you do the right thing. You'd say, oh, pastor, what a surprise. Come in, come in. We're so happy to see you. And then you notice 
oh my goodness, there's dishes in the kitchen and there's shoes in the hallway and the, and the, 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 the furniture hasn't been dusted in a week and I was watching TV. Oh my gosh, what was I watching on TV? I hope it wasn't Game of Thrones. And then you think to yourself, what am I going to do with a pastor anyway? Like, what, what can I say to a pastor? What can I say to a pastor? And these are all the kind of things that would be going through your mind, right? Well, those are all the kind of things that were going through Martha's mind, too, only amplified by like a hundred, because it wasn't just a pastor and his family. This is Jesus and the twelve apostles. And not only that, but Martha is a part of a Middle Eastern culture where hospitality is, is considered a virtue, it's considered an art, and something of a competition sport. People were always eager to host Jesus and the apostles because it gave such honor to them as the host. I mean, to stop for a moment and consider how many gospel stories begin with Jesus and the apostles gathered around a table, sharing a meal, and that's the setting for Jesus to launch into a parable or a sermon or a teaching or to work a miracle or something. This happens time and time and time and time and time again. Martha knows that in her village and beyond, people will be talking about this meal for years to come, and Martha so wants to get it right. But there is just so much to do, and all of it last minute. You know, the house needs tidying, the food needs cooking, the guests need entertaining, and like, how do you entertain Jesus anyway? I mean, what do you do with Jesus? Like, do you play cards with him? You know, can you give him a beer? Can you tell him a joke? Can you tell him back jokes? Like, what do you do? So Martha so wants this meal to go well. It's such an honor for her to have Jesus and the twelve apostles as guests in her house, but there's so much pressure upon her to be the perfect hostess. There's so much anxiety for her to be on her best behavior at every single moment. There's so much awkwardness being around religious men like this, and there's just so much to do to get the food on the table. And on top of that, she's the only one doing anything because her lazy, good-for-nothing sister is just sitting there not doing a single thing. So really now, is it any wonder what happens next? Verse 39. So she had a sister named Mary who sat at the Lord's feet and listened to what he was saying. But Martha was distracted by her many tasks. And so she came and said to him, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to do all this work by myself? Tell her then to help. Okay, so Martha kind of snaps. Gets a little snippy, blows it, loses her cool. I get it. It's not a good thing to do. But I mean, come on, we've all been there, haven't we? We can all relate. I know I can. You know, in my line of work as a pastor, there are two days every year when we roll out the red carpet and bend over backwards to, to, to welcome hundreds and hundreds of guests into our house. Easter and Christmas Eve. Well, this last Christmas Eve, we did what we always do here at St. John Lutheran on Christmas Eve. You know, we had the brass, we had the choir, we had the candle lights, we had the silent light, we had the trees, we had the decorations. We did what we always do on Christmas Eve, but this last Christmas Eve, I wanted to do something extra, luminaries. Because I thought it would be a really nice touch if people had luminaries going into and out of the church. What a perfect way to you know, put the ice on the cake. So this year, Four o'clock on Christmas Eve, I and my wife Michelle and my seven-year-old Matthew and then Matt Olson from the church, we were out there at four o'clock on Christmas Eve setting up luminaries all around the sidewalks of the church. 150 luminaries. Which we found out takes a lot longer to do than you would think. <laughs> and so come 4.30 on Christmas Eve, we are still out there setting up luminaries and people are already starting to arrive for the five o'clock service. At 4.40, I'm still out there, and I need to be in here because there's already hundreds of people in here, and who would have thought that you're supposed to turn on the air conditioning for Christmas Eve? I didn't, but apparently you're supposed to, and I'm the only person who knows how to do that in the entire building, so I need to be in my office fiddling with the computer, but I also need to be back here getting both the mic and getting the acolytes ready. I'm out there. I want to be in here. I need to be there. I need to be here, too, and pretty soon... It's the most important evening in the entire church here. Hundreds of guests are coming to worship the Lord Jesus Christ. And like Martha, I was so distracted by my many tasks that I nearly lost it. <laughs> no, I didn't. But she did. 
Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to do all of this work by myself? It's bad enough. Right? It's bad enough that Martha trash talks her sister in front of a house full of guests. But what's even worse is what Martha says about Jesus. Lord, do you not care? Of course Jesus cares. But you see, Martha is speaking out of a place of hurt. I mean, put yourself in Martha's shoes. Here she is, busting her chops for Jesus, unexpectedly and on the spur of the moment, nonetheless. And not only is not a single other person helping her, but Jesus doesn't even seem to notice all she's doing, which makes Martha wonder if Jesus even cares. Lord, do you not care? that my sister has left me to do all this work by myself. Tell her to get in there and help me. Martha commands Jesus, which is not a good thing to do. <laughs> Martha commands Jesus to command Mary to get off her duff in the kitchen and get to work. It is bold, it is brazen, it is shocking, it is impolite, it is certainly impolitic. But Martha does it because she's hurt. She's speaking from this place of hurt. She feels overburdened. She feels overworked. She feels overlooked. And she feels unloved. And Jesus knows it. Jesus recognizes it. And Jesus speaks to her right in that place of hurt. Verse 41. But the Lord answered her, Martha, Martha. And notice how tenderly he speaks. To her. He calls her twice by name, the first time to get her attention, the second time to let her know that he sees her. Martha, Martha. Notice how tenderly Jesus speaks to her, and then notice what Jesus says, and how he speaks right to the concerns of her heart. He says, Martha, you are worried, and you are distracted. You see, Jesus sees her work. Jesus sees all the pressure from within to be the perfect hostess. Jesus sees her inner anxiety, the matter, that no matter what she does, it's not going to be good enough. That no matter what she does, she will be good enough to host Jesus as her guest. Jesus sees all of that, her inner anxiety and her worry. And Jesus sees the outer anxiety, the pressure, the 101 details it takes to host a party of 13 people, the hustle and the bustle in the kitchen, the hurry and the scurry to get the house ready, all the sweat and the labor of all the things that Martha is doing to serve him. Jesus sees that too. Jesus sees her worry and her distraction. Jesus sees the pressure within and the pressure without. Jesus sees all that Martha is doing. And Jesus sees that Martha is doing all of it out of love for him. Jesus doesn't discount it or dismiss it, not one bit. But Jesus also sees that in all of these things Martha is doing, with all of these things that Martha is busy about, Martha's missing one big thing. And that's Jesus. Martha is so busy doing all of these things for Jesus, that she's not letting Jesus do anything for her. She hasn't let Jesus speak to her. She hasn't let Jesus minister to her. She hasn't let Jesus bless her. She hasn't let Jesus serve her. And that's the very thing that Martha needs. That's the very reason why Jesus came to her house in the first place was to bless her. She's missing out. Verse 41. Martha, Martha, you were worried and distracted by many things. But there is only one thing that is needed. One thing for Martha, one thing for Mary, one thing for you, one thing for me, and that is to sit at the feet of Jesus and to spend time with him. When you find yourself feeling like Martha, like you've got a thousand and one things to do and not nearly enough time to do it. Like no one else is helping you and you're doing it all by yourself. Like you're overburdened, overworked, overlooked, and unloved. Stop and ask yourself, have I spent any time with Jesus today? I feel like Jesus doesn't see me. I feel like Jesus doesn't notice me. I feel like Jesus doesn't love me. I feel like Jesus doesn't care for me. Is that what Jesus actually says? 
Am I listening to him or am I listening to my own heart, my own anxiety, my own worry, my own fear? I've got all of these things to do and no one else to help me do it, but do I really need to do all these things? Are they essential to the task at hand or are they just extra? So many luminaries on the way to the main event. As crazy as it sounds to say, as hard as it is to hear, when it comes to loving God, sometimes less is more. And at all times, there's only one thing you need to do. Are you doing it? Are you spending time with Jesus? Are you taking time with Jesus? Are you listening to Him every day? Even if it's only for five or ten minutes a day, are you reading His Word, reflecting on what He says, responding to Him in prayer and with the Lord's Prayer? Now in the sermon next week, I'm going to teach you about that, teach you how to do that. And then we're going to come back to it for two different sermons, two different weeks in the fall, because it's that important for us, it's that important for you to spend time with Jesus every single day. But for now, I simply want you to know this, that when you find yourself feeling like Mary, with a thousand and one things to do and not nearly enough time to do it, stop and ask yourself, am I spending time with Jesus? And if not, why not? Because it's the one thing you need to do, the one thing that will not be taken away, the one thing needful is to spend time with Jesus every single day. You know, we all want to be like Mary. But in practice, we tend to live like Martha, trying to do too many things, and then we wonder why we feel out of sorts. It doesn't have to be that way. You don't have to live that way. Choose the one thing you need to do, which is spend time with Jesus and let Him serve you. Amen? Amen. Let us pray. Lord God Almighty, we thank you and we praise you. God, you have walked into our lives. Lord, you have knocked on the door and we have let you in. And now, Jesus, give us the grace to do the thing you command us to do, to do the thing you want us to do, to do the thing for which you came, Jesus, which is to spend time with you. Lord, when we are hurried and harried and distracted by many things, Lord, call us back to our senses. Call us back to yourself that we might spend time with you. For Jesus, that is why you have come into our lives. And we ask it in your holy name. Amen. And at this time, I invite forward the guests of honor, Kagan and Calvin for the baptism.
teach them the Lord's Prayer and pray for them for nuns, to place them in their hands the Holy Spirit, to provide them with the Christian church, so that living within the covenant of this their baptism and a community of the church, they can count in the exalted of the day that Jesus Christ gives you. Now these are the obligations that you take upon yourself as the parents and as the God parents. You want to go This candle is to be lighted each year on this day in celebration of your new birth and holy baptism. From Matthew, let your light 
also shine before others that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. Let us pray for our church and all people according to our needs. <coughs> Heavenly Father, we come to you today giving you all of our praise. We praise you for your majesty, your power, and your sovereignty. We praise you as the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, for we know all comes from you. Lord, in your mercy, Lord, we also come before you today with thankful hearts. We thank you for all that you provide us. Thank you for your Son, Jesus Christ. We thank you for the freedom to worship you without threat or persecution. We pray for those who are persecuted for their faith. Help them to remain strong in faith and give them the strength in their trials. Lord, in your mercy. Father, we live in such a busy world full of distractions and things that are always trying to keep us from turning our thoughts to you. We do want to be more like Mary. Help us to slow down and turn to you, not only when we are facing our trials, but to continually think and meditate on you daily. You've promised us a heavenly home where we will be with you forever. Lord, we look forward to that day when we'll, we'll be able to worship you endlessly and glorify and praise your name unceasingly. Help us to rest our faith and hope in you alone. Lord, in your mercy. Yeah. Lord, today is a special day at St. John's. We thank you for the baptism of Kagan and Kelsey. 
We also thank you to our special guests, Pam and Kelsey from Project Talitha Kune. Thank you for calling them to this ministry and for all that they do. Lord, we lift them up this morning as they continue to minister to the girls that live with them. Continue to guide and lead them as they do your will. Lord, in your mercy. And Father, we lift up our elected officials. We ask that your wisdom guide them and that all, that their, all their decisions will glorify your holy name. Lord, in your mercy. And we continue to remember and lift up all the men and women who are serving in the armed forces around the world. We especially lift up Josh Bitsky, Forrest Moss, Morgan Moss, Luke Jordan, Michelle Jordan, Ryan Harada, Arthur Waltrip, Rusty Nail, Brad Turnbaugh, Brian G, and Zachary Herman. Please protect them and keep them safe until they return home to their families and friends. Lord, in your mercy. And Heavenly Father, today we lift up all those who are in need of your special care and healing. We lift up Clint Shield, Ralph Herman, Francis Laubach, my father Berlin, and all members in residential care. We also lift up those who are in need of your special healing. We lift up Shirley Stettel, Mary Kendall, Karen and Jim Richmond, Heather Watson, Bill Phelps, Dean Roeder, Lana Christopher, Christopher Hefner, Tim and Sally Evans, Marlene Barnes, Shane Jureski, George, Linda Brennan, Lana Christopher, Joyce Peters, Cynthia Hallmark, for the Ross's granddaughter, Matt Cress, Jerry Schnabel, Tim Latin, Mary Roberts, Horst, Katie, Selene, and Amy, Jared Janik, Judith Bingham, Linda Nickerson, Patty Gompass, and Francis Schulte. Provide them with the comfort and healing you can provide. Lord, in your mercy. Yeah. And Lord, today we celebrate the birth of Grady, born to you, Derek and Casey Boyd, and Benjamin, son of Don and Will Rogers. Thank you for this new life, Lord. Lord, in your mercy. Yeah. And we lift up our congregation to St. John's. You commission us to go into the world with the promise of your son, Jesus Christ. Thank you for Pastor Eric and Pastor Mariola, our church council members and all who serve you by serving this congregation in some way. We lift them up this morning and ask that you continue to guide and that your Holy Spirit leads and speaks to them and that all that they do glorifies your holy name. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Through your hands, O oh Lord, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy, through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Please be seated as now we worship the Lord with our offerings, and we have a special welcome to Mary Lou Patterson. She's back to play a duet with TJ. Thank you. 
Let us pray. Merciful God, everything you have in your earth belongs to you. We joyfully release what you have entrusted to us. May these gifts be signs of our whole lives to turn to you. Dedicated to the beginning and the end of all creation. Through Jesus Christ.
above you to watch over you and within you to give you his peace. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Be thou my vision is our closing.